All righty. Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Standards of Safety. Today, we got a guest for you. He's a man of many talents, really. And one thing coming up, as we know in the construction world, mainly besides the fatal four, one of our biggest death tolls is suicide. And this is going to be a pretty, pretty heavy topic this, uh, this episode. But, you know, we're stepping into September. And our guest today, Brandon, has some significant knowledge in it and really loved uh, going to be able to get his take on it. And if you don't like it, he'll just kick your ass because he's MMA. <laughs> so you're going to listen to him anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, welcome, uh, Dave and Brandon. Enjoy it, man. How are you doing today, Brandon? I'm doing I'm doing very well. I'm over here at the at the Oregon coast. Uh taking a little break before my daughter goes back to school. So, uh, oh, yeah, just enjoying good. the weather. How are you guys doing? Not too bad. Not doing too good. bad. What do you mean doing going good. back to school is, has the, have y'all not started school yet? No, we start a little bit later than some of the oh. other states. Yeah. Like yeah. My, my mom, she drives a bus back home in Texas and they started school like a week or two ago. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so my daughter goes back to school uh, next week. Okay. Yeah. Right on. So how what? long is, is, when did y'all summer start? Like, when do they end school? Um, right around the end of May, beginning of June, somewhere like right there in that in that ballpark. Yeah. It's about the same, ain't it, Dave? For us, roughly. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Funny, because I, I was just talking to to my wife, and we were like, you know, we remember when we were kids, summer lasted a lot longer than what it does now. Yeah, yeah. it's like holy shit, yeah. they're going back to school already. Hell, yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Listeners, again, Mr. Brandon Henley's with us. He has what you started as a um, a roughneck in the oil field, right? Around twenty five or something like that. Um, so I was I was nineteen years old. Nineteen, okay. I was nineteen. Uh, my stepdad <laughs> he worked out in the oil field, and you know I graduated high school, didn't quite have a plan, and he's like, "Hey, let's you know you're gonna come make some money out here." So I said, okay, let's let's do it. I had no idea what that entailed. I did not realize, you know, working eighty to a hundred hours a week every yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, so, now, where's this located? Because you mentioned your mom's still in Texas, and you're in yeah. Oregon. So, where'd you do your oil field work at? Uh, so I did my oil field work in South Texas, West Texas, and Oklahoma. I traveled okay. a lot uh, through there. I I didn't move up here to Oregon until the beginning of 2018. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So I spent born and raised Texan, spent all my life there, worked in the field. Yeah. 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 Oh my yeah. gosh. Full blooded Texan. <laughs> yeah. Dave and I See, always I joke with each other on that. He he calls me just a southern hillbilly and I call him a <laughs> Illinois Yankee. I, mean, I would say, yeah, see, I'm a Chicago boy, so I yeah, I'm a Yankee. <laughs> but no, so nineteen years old, started roughnecking. And I know that you said uh, safety is is a big, important factor of your life as well. And, and what you try to do is you're coaching, you're mentoring, and some of the things that's come up through your career in safety, what are what are some of the most biggest impacts that's had on your, your career getting from the roughneck into safety? The thing that actually pushed me into safety um, was being a part of two different fatalities at a young mm-hmm. age. Uh, being on location when it happened. Uh, the the first one was someone around my age. So that one really at hit At the time, me. 19? Mm-hmm. At the time, yeah. He, he just oh. turned 20. Uh, he had a baby oh, on man. the way. And he was supposed to get married. Um, and I was on the job site where it happened. It happened uh, across the site from me. But, you know, we were one team. And I, I knew the kid very well. We connected well because because of our age. You know, it's... It's a difficult thing being out there at a young age because a lot of those guys, they've been out there for years and years. And when you first get out there, it's a lot of hazing. It's a little bit of bullying, it feels like. So, you know, young guys kind of stick together. And so that one, that one, that one took a toll on me. That one really opened my eyes. Right. As, as a young guy, you sometimes, you sometimes feel like you're, you're bulletproof. Right. Yeah. That that young age thing, like nothing can happen to you. And in the blink of an eye, something happens. And, that was the first thing that that I witnessed, and then I witnessed another one, which was something that had to do really heavy with lockout tagout, and you know, witnessed a guy who 
got blended up and he, Ooh. he didn't get to go home to his family. It came out later that he had a wife and three kids. And oh my know, God. when I give my orientations at work and I give it the lockout tag out portion, I speak to this event and, uh, you know, then it, it, it took a toll on me emotionally. Um, yeah. But when I had a kid is when it really did. All right. I started, I started telling the story as, a, uh, after I had my daughter and I remember telling it the first time after I had my daughter and I talked about how this guy, we were working night shift. And the only thing that I could think of was how these kids were probably waking up about the time that dad's mm-hmm. supposed to get home. And then dad never shows up. And right. I remember actually like coming to tears, telling the story in orientation. I pride myself on being a, a good father. And yeah. You know, I, I feel like I'm a bit of an empath. And so I, I feel these things heavily. I feel them in my soul though. So those two things really pushed me into, into safety. It was what, what can I help do to help make sure people go home to their families at the end of the day? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, 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 what little things, little, could it be coaching? Could it be, you know, someone needed a SRL to tie off to and they didn't have one. And I got them one in a pinch, like the little things, those little, those little things like that throughout the day can yep. alter how, how someone's day goes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not to get too deep into it, but what was it? A, a propeller or some type of fan or something, I guess. So it was a, an agitator. So on the, on the drilling uh, rigs where they put all the, the chemicals and all the stuff to mix up, to go down to the drill bit. And he was a pressure washer and they couldn't get power to the rig. So someone told him, Hey, just jump in there and pressure wash it. Well, eventually they got power. Someone up on the rig floor flipped the switch while he was in there. And it's just a giant blender. It was horrible, yeah. horrible. Thing. Yeah. Oh okay. my gosh. Man, so see, listeners, that's one episode. This is one episode of why Dave and I really started this to get experience from people uh, around the world that's dealt with this and be able to give you a story that you may be able to relate to. So, yeah, man, at a young age, I, I can only imagine what it, what that did do to you. I bet you went home and probably had trouble sleeping the next couple of weeks, huh? I did. I did. Um I, I, I feel things very, very heavily. Just I'm a very emotional person as it is. And these things sit with me and I have trouble sleeping and I find myself sitting and stewing on what yeah. if, what if <laughs> one thing went different? Yep. What yep. if one thing went different and the course of someone's life has changed? Yeah. Yep. Of course, in this case, it was three, four lives. He had three kids. Yeah. Three kids. Three kids, and kids and a mom. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and I found, cause I, I've lost friends too, not, not in that kind of type of situation, but lost friends that I've worked with and you're right. I mean, that night you go home and it's like, oh my gosh. And you, you, you actually get to like, kind of, uh, think about, and it can kind of wrap your head around what the hell just happened. But for me, the hard, the, one of the hardest parts was going back to work at my next shift, knowing that they should be there and that they're not there. Interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, man, this is so weird. And then it starts to really kind of sit in. He's really gone. You know, it wasn't something that, you know, not that you dreamed it or anything like that, but you know, your, your mind tries to use, some kind of, you know, defense mechanism, like maybe that really didn't happen. Yeah. You know, but then that next shift and he's not there, it, it, it did happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. That's a, you know what, I've been doing this probably 13 or so years and Dave, that's a perspective. I don't think I've ever looked, looked at it like, cause you know, cause you know, fortunately that's never happened on a job site that I've been on. So I haven't had Mm -hmm. to think that far ahead as to, I'm going to go to work today. And the guy that sits to me or the lady that sits to me eating lunch, not there anymore. And it's not because she's on vacation. Yeah. I had a, I had a good friend, uh, Brent, Brent, I don't know, you know, my story, but I was a paramedic for like 20 plus years. 
had a friend that had a cardiac arrest at work and I actually worked on him. And it, it and that was that situation. You know, I mean, him and I, you know, went to concerts, hung out, good friends. And then that next shift that, that he wasn't there, even though I actually worked on him, it was still that defensive thing, but that next shift and when he, and whenever he wasn't there, that really concreted it in. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you, when you wake up the morning after, right? Your, your brain, you feel like you, you look, the second your eyes open, you're like, please have been a dream. Please have been a dream. Yeah. And then yeah. as soon as yeah. you sit up and you start kind of getting your day going, you realize that that happened. And it happened. Mm -hmm. it, it, it shakes you. It shakes you to your core. It oh, really yeah. does. And so how far apart were those two incidences in your career at that age? Um, so the first one was about when I was 19. I wasn't in the field very long. And the other one was I was about 23. So they were a few years apart. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the, when did you get into safety? I got into safety at 25. Okay. How so, did you, what was your first, like for our listeners, somebody that, it, you know, could be following your footsteps, started in the oil field, maybe have seen a couple incidences like that. And then what did you do to kind of start headed towards safety? Did you do like an OSHA 31st or just start working with the safety team or what was your first step into safety? So the first thing I did was I talked to the uh, company safety manager. Um, <clears throat> I was, I was good friends with him. He's a really good guy. And I told him about how I felt and I just, I told him, I said, I want to, I want to help make a difference out here. What do I need to do? And he gave me a list of, you know, basic courses like an OSHA 30, um, a Haswopper, first aid CPR, just little things to kind of, to kind of get you going. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of these big companies these days, they want bachelor's degrees. They want schooling. I didn't have any of that. All I had was experience of working next to these guys in the field and the experience of losing family members in the field like that. Right. Those yeah. out there, are your brothers. So right. all that's all I brought. All I was able to bring to the table was a little bit of experience and uh, a lot of drive. Right. There, there was a reason I, I had reason behind it and they worked with me on it. Um, they helped me get more certifications and mm -hmm. they were, they were very small certifications. You know, they were nothing, nothing big, but it was enough to get my foot in the door and get started. Mm -hmm. And from there it was, okay, what can I do to grow in this career? So yeah. I was a very, very thankful to the safety manager from that company for giving me that opportunity to help make a difference. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So we had a, a guest about three weeks ago, he was the first one that gave me mine. And, you know, we always try to ask our guests to give some feedback to a listener. And I actually jumped in and said, one thing that I would say is get a mentor, you know, because Dennis was an excellent mentor for me, but fortunately he's, he's out in the boondocks of Texas and his Wi-Fi was messing up on us. So we couldn't, it didn't get to completely upload. So we didn't get to publish that episode yet, but, uh, yeah, same thing. And get you a mentor, get you somebody that can help you out. And sure enough, they'll they'll keep you in the right direction. When whenever I moved from Texas to up here up north and I took a job out of the oil field, different industry, and <laughs> I met a guy who um I was still very green and safe. He didn't know a whole lot. Especially people don't realize how different oil field and construction is. Like yeah. the differences in just the type of work you do and what safety looks like in these two different places. Uh, the safety looks different across different industries, right? Absolutely. You have the same common goal, but the processes can be different in what the workers are doing and what you have to help them with. So I met this guy and I felt like he picked on me a little bit at first because he knew I was green. You know, he was, he was getting me on a lot of things. And then eventually he kind of took me under his wing and he, he showed me a lot. He taught me a lot. Um, he helped push me to get my CHST. Uh, he definitely changed my course and my safety career. He, he put me on the right path. I did not really know exactly what I was doing, but finding a mentor, big, big thing. I, oh, I yeah. heavily agree with that. Yep. So, uh, 
Um, so you got your CHST when you went to Oregon, got in a completely different uh, field of safety, and you've been doing that same. You, when did you move to Oregon again, or how uh, long have you been there now? I got I got here in 2018. So the 2018. 2018. Okay, so you've been in Oregon in five years. Do you like this career that you've got now better than the oil field? I do, I do, and the reason that is is um, so. Working in the oil field my entire life like that, I had seen where a lot of dads were never home. Yeah. And I heard a yeah. lot of, you know, phone calls of missed birthdays and mm -hmm. I could hear these men like missing their kids, missing their families. And so when my now wife got pregnant, I told myself, I will not ever be that dad. Yeah. yeah. I didn't have much of a father growing up and I wasn't going to be the dad that was always gone. I just, I couldn't do it. And so I said, we have to make a change for the betterment of our family, I have to be a involved dad. Yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah, I, that I, was, I, worth I, was I was on the pipeline and same thing. I mean, I, we had a lot of guys that weren't from that area and, you know, they'd get phone calls and, you know, a day or two later, they're dragging up because they're like, hey, I got to get home. My wife's going to leave me if I don't get home. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I, I've seen yeah. marriages and yeah. families yeah. break apart. All over the all mm -hmm. over the money. It's not the the money itself is not worth it. It's about the better right. life, right? Exactly. Yep. And and that's the funniest thing. As long as I've been doing this, it's like there's construction work everywhere in the world going on. You just can't ever find it in your backyard. Why the hell is yeah. that? No matter where yeah. you're at, it's not yeah. in your backyard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, what yep. is going on? <laughs> that is very true. Very yeah. True. So. Um, See what? Else? So you get to Oregon, and then it, it, now that you've got somewhat of a sim, uh, simpler life as far as more of a nine to five, and not eighty to a hundred hours, is that when you start training? We're going to we're going to talk about your uh, oh yeah your, your extracurricular side now. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So I started training for two different reasons. One reason was uh, prior to training, I was a bodybuilder. I was about. 250 pounds and Damn. one day I was bent over putting on my boots and just how heavy I was breathing to yeah. do so because I was so dense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I admire bodybuilding, but it's not healthy. And yeah. I'm thinking like I'm walking up these steps and ladders all day and my breathing was not there. So I did not feel like a very healthy individual. It's, how tall uh, are you? Uh, six one. Okay. Wow. Six one, 250? I was, I was big, dude. I was really. <laughs> I was, or, I was thinking, Corey's like, I'm not going to ask that question. I'm not going to ask that. Uh, no, nope, never mind. Well, I was thinking, you know, 250 at like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, you kind of look lean, you know, but 6'1", yeah. you were just, like you said, dense. Holy very, cow. Very dense. And so it was a combination. I was lifting heavy and then uh, my wife was pregnant. So it was eating she was eating mm -hmm. for two and so was i right like i was eating <laughs> everything that she was yeah yeah uh, and so i just got overall just really really big and i felt unhealthy and then found out we were having a little girl which is what i wanted right and i know that that this is not necessarily the best world we live in and mm. I want my girls to be able to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So what, what yeah. better way for them to learn than to me to set the example by training and help teaching that and instilling that in them at a young age. Yeah. So I started training jujitsu and a little bit of striking. And after talking with my then coach, he was like, you know, you're young, you have got the strength, you've got, you know, the drive. I think we can fast track you as far as like trying to get like your belt ranks and things. He goes, would you want to compete? And I was like, you know, I'm a very competitive person. I played sports all growing up. I've always loved being active and being part of like a team setting. I was like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So I started training and yeah, it's just become a part of our life. Now my daughter's five years old. She trains Muay Thai. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Wow. My wife, she does. She, she trains a little bit too. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a big part of our life now. That's awesome. See, that's, yeah, that, I've done jiu jitsu awesome. for a little bit, and I got my daughter in it. Uh, just wasn't she just didn't take to it, and you know, I, I 
didn't pull her out the first time she started whining or I don't want to go. I actually made her stay with it, stay with it. And then when I truly see it myself, that there's just no passion there for it. That's when I was like, okay, we, we can stop going now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, so it's, it's hit or miss, you know, it's hit or miss whether or not people take to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, right. It's but something it's I love. Course. I love, you know, Dave was in judo though, and he actually owned his own dojo. So have you done any judo training or learn how to throw like that? Or, um, we, we did some judo throws that we would mix in with our <laughs> jujitsu. So the, the first gym that I trained at, um, our idea when it came to fighting was use your striking to set up a clinch, to set up a takedown, whether that be like a, a toss or, yeah. or maybe if you have to jump, drop down mm -hmm. to like a single or double leg, and then you find the submission from there. So I did a little bit, but not a lot. I, I definitely have been thrown by some judo guys, and that's definitely not fun. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's Good why time. you learn how to fall before you learn how to throw. Yeah. That, I mean, you know, I, I had a I had a master say, you know, uh, you fall 99 times, you get up 100. So to, to be able to fall and get up, th that's the key. And yeah. learning how to fall correctly, right? Not trying to post oh, with your arm. That's how you oh, break yeah. something. Yeah, that's why, yeah, you start baby mm -hmm. steps on your knees and you practice your front falls, side falls, and back falls. Yep, over absolutely. and over and over, even before you learned your first throw. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah. We learn how to tuck and roll. Yep. Gotta, mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotta, roll, too, gotta yeah. roll with the flow. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I had my, <laughs> had my, my first fight in October of 2021. It would have had one sooner, but uh, COVID kind of, you know, put oh, the yeah. halt on competitions. So I had my first fight in October 2021. I fought five times total so far and i've got one big one lined up at the end of the year nice so what's your record right now so i'm three and two i have a uh, one decision win two straight wins in a row now by head kick knockout in the first round wow uh my two losses one i got submitted by a 270 pound wrestler he Ooh. was he was quite a massive human being and, yeah <laughs> 270 yeah yeah it was yeah. like on the feet, I had him, but the second he took me down, I, just, I, I couldn't get up. And it kind of found out later that he was like an Olympic-level wrestler. And I was ah. like, well, you know, I felt that in there. That makes sense. Yeah. So a little and, sandbag, huh? Yeah. yeah. He sandbagged Maybe. a little bit to get – I've had that yeah. people. Tell yeah, you something, yeah. sandbaggers aren't doing anything for this sport. No. <laughs> no, not at all. Quit sandbagging so. and compete at your level. <laughs> yeah. So, so now I have a, because I have two, two straight wins in a row now by knockout, I have a heavyweight title fight in December in Washington main event. Wow. So it's going to be a fun one. I don't know who I'm fighting yet. I'm sure it's going to be some behemoth, but uh, that's awesome though, man. I'm excited for you. Hope you win. Oh, yeah. What's your, what's your weight now? What's heavyweight for you at the moment? Um, I, I sit around two thirty, pretty comfortable. Okay. Yeah. 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 Do you try to cut a little bit? What is heavyweight's minimum weight? Uh, two two oh seven. Oh wow! Okay. So two, wow. Heavyweight is two oh seven to two sixty five. It's quite the the spectrum. Yeah, that's wow. kind yeah, of fair, is it? <laughs> Sixty pounds. It's it's big. It's Christmas. Yeah. When I when I fought I mean, that wrestler, I was probably around two twenty, and he came in at like right at the end of like two sixty five, two sixty six. He was a big boy. <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna say Ed, if I'm fighting somebody at 260, I'm gonna run around until they <laughs> gas out, and then I'm gonna knock them out. Yeah, just yeah. you know, just they, they're huffing and puffing, and, and then all of a sudden, yeah, now I'm gonna start. Right. Yeah, it's like a wrestling one. a damn grizzly bear, 270 <laughs> something pounds. <laughs> he was, he was big, <laughs> man. But you know, Rope I, something I, shiny, I, and then hit him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I took the fight right to him though, you know, like the, none of those guys scared me. It's yeah. we're all, we're all human. We, we all bleed the same. So I just took the fight right to him. Like what happens happens from that point. Yeah. Now do you feel you got a pretty solid chin. Can you take a good punch or you kind of normal? A punch. Okay. I can take, I, I can. Here's the thing is the, the one of the loss I had was it was a TKO and uh, I never went out, but it, it wobbled me and it was the punch you don't see coming. Right. Yeah. We got yep. in this little exchange, and he hit me with this very weird, like, uppercut hook, just right to the chin. Never saw that one. 
and that's the one that wobbled my legs and the referee stopped yeah. it, which yeah, I, I will still protest to this day. The fight could have went on longer, but we're amateurs, and so the the referees are going to protect us from ourselves. Right, we're yeah. Not, right. We're not getting paid to fight. So when we get paid, you know, it's a little bit different. The referees are like, hey, this is kind of a job for you. But yeah. as amateurs, they got to protect us from ourselves. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Interesting point. I was just telling Dave. So my wife's in HR at a local bank here in Omaha. They go, there's this huge conference or this huge um, organization for HR, like SRAM or SHRM or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this uh, public figure, his name is, he changed his name to Cam F. Awesome. I don't know if you might have heard him through the sport or not, but he spoke there last night or the uh, Friday night. Stephanie tells me about it and we watch his Netflix uh, documentary. It's called, I think, Punched Out or something like that. But talking about the amateurs, you know, the Olympic organization now, I can't remember what acronym it was, but they're taking the headgear off the boxers now. And there's a lot of say or talk about not going to the Olympics anymore, going straight to pro because you're not being protected. And it's just you. And they were showing kids that having cut eyes right here and being being out and then getting concussions at 19 yeah. or 20 years old. So like, why would I do that when I could just go to pro and make some money and, and get my concussion at 25 versus 45, you know? Right. And, and, and to go pro these days, all it really takes is <laughs> going to get a license for it. Really? That's, and you're, it, and you're stepping toward that, right? Yeah. Yeah. This will be my last year as an amateur. Um, it's awesome. I want to go pro, and, and I'm not doing it, obviously, as, as a job because I love my career that I'm in now. Um, I'm doing it because, for one, I want to be able to look back in a couple of years and be like, I did that. I, I yeah. accomplished that goal. And then the other thing is, if I'm doing it for fun, for free, why, why not get paid a little bit of cash for it? Yeah, right. for sure. Get oh, a little yeah. sponsors, get some free supplements. Yep. There you go. Absolutely. Get, some, get some cool uh, rash get shorts. Get some gear. And... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, hey, support them new Adidas walking into the <laughs> ring, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, man, you've you've definitely had a heck of a career. I love it. So you're just with one one child right now, or because you said daughters. So do you have uh, two or just just one? Just one. Um, so my wife is. We have quite an age difference between us, and she's a little bit older. So hmm. we actually tried to. We didn't plan to have a kid at all. She had a IUD. She had birth control, and my daughter was just bound and determined to happen. So there you we, go. Yeah, she's going to be tough. One. Yeah, we had the one. <laughs> and my wife, she just turned forty three. So uh, we're we're good. You know, there's no sense in the older years trying to do it all again. Right. So we're happy, yeah. we're happy with one. She's spoiled. So they're both spoiled. Oh, of course. <laughs> I've got I've got one too and I constantly tell her, I'm like, honey, I don't mind spoiling you. As a matter of fact, I want to spoil you, but you're not gonna be a brat. You're gonna you're gonna <laughs> learn the gratefulness from what I've been able to accumulate through my career and being able to do this for you. You yep. know, you're not gonna take take it for granted. So Absolutely. Yes, you're my baby. Yeah. You're the only you're gonna be spoiled you know, yada, 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 but you're going to know what you're going to be grateful for it. So, Absolutely. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a difference in, in spoiling and then having a spoiled brat, right? Yes. Two oh, yeah. Big difference in these two. <laughs> two big differences. And that's yes. what I try to explain to her, you know, so she can get that young. Um, so going forward, man, let's talk about, let's talk about your other passion um, coming up in September. So, what really got mm -hmm. you into, and this is something that Dave and I really try to stress a lot about, not just trying to be, you know, the, the resource and support that safety should be out there, but understanding, understanding your peer, understanding your colleague, where's the mental health mm -hmm. challenges that they're going through right now and how can we step in and break it down? And one of the, big facilities that I worked at. Well, Dave and I both worked at, they've got a program called mental health first aiders. You actually sit through a real class. It's about an eight hour class. Now you don't get certified to do anything, but you know enough to actually talk someone off the ledge, so to say, right? Yeah. 
So what got you in that field? What made, um, what made that such a passion for you? I lived it. So I, uh, I had some trauma that happened to me when I was a kid. And it was something that in the back of my mind, I just kind of shelved <laughs> it. Right? I never, I never did anything about it. And through the course of my younger years, even as a young teenager, I'd always kind of dealt with depression a little bit, but as a kid, I don't know that it's depression. I don't know what any of that really means. And then I got into, it was the winter after 2020 going into 2021. And, you know, things, I, I guess things just finally caught up to me. I, my mind spiraled down this bad path and I fell to these depths that I, I couldn't seem to pull myself out of. I was living a life where I, I was just existing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I wasn't mentally there at work. Um, I would go to the gym. I wasn't mentally there. I had to force myself to go. Uh, it was, it was single-handedly the, probably the worst time in my entire life. Uh, got real close a couple times to taking my own life during that period. Mm -hmm. Tried staying as strong as I could for my daughter and, and for my wife. But I think what some people don't realize is I hear a lot of people say that suicide is selfish. I think people don't realize that when someone's in that state, it's not that they don't care. It's that it's that they can't. Right. Right. It's like, you, you, you want to care. You want to care about everyone around you. Um, but you can't, you can't even care about yourself. It's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. And my mind became a prison that I mm. was locked in. And the thing that finally told me I had to get help was when I, when I became comfortable with the fact of me not existing. Yeah. Like I would have like a minor thing would happen in my life and it would cause me to spiral more. And then I would feel relief by saying it won't matter in a couple of days because I just knew that I was done. Like I was going to find a way to do it that wow. any of this responsibility that I'm worrying about it's in a few days, doesn't matter. I won't be here. And that's when I knew like I, I had to do something and I've always been that guy that said, I don't need a therapist. I don't need someone sitting across from me telling me what's wrong with me. Like these people don't know me. Right. Hey, anyone out there listening? I couldn't be more wrong. Yeah. Therapy saved my life. So Damn. I, I went and saw a therapist and I just had to tell her everything and she helped pinpoint all these things that happened to me from the time I was a child till now and how those things that happened then, you know, that's the way I interact with people now, or that's the way I feel about certain things now that I never realized. So I, I, I had to take charge and change and change my life, but I, that it become the passionate thing because I lived that life. I tried committing suicide twice when I was around 14 and then, that summer or that winter of 2020 to 2021, uh, there was probably another two or three times that I was, I was closer to the edge then than I had ever been in my entire life. Yeah. And you think the, the COVID kind of, kind of, you know, sped that up or kind of brought that up to the forefront. You know, I know it's a, hard a lot of people were saying that, you know, there are a lot of people taking their lives during COVID. I didn't know if, you know, that kind of lit the, fuse it, it's hard to pinpoint if it was because my life didn't change very much during covid i still worked every day mm -hmm. um i still worked out every day i had a home gym and stuff like that i mean the world was definitely changing that didn't help stuff right that definitely <laughs> that didn't help anything um i was dealing with a lot of internal things that like i said that happened to me when i was young and i never processed them mm -hmm. and I don't know what triggered any of my thoughts, but something one day just, I was thinking about it and went down the rabbit hole and couldn't find my way back. Yeah. Mm. Felt worthless. I don't, I, I don't think people that haven't gone through that and, and, and I've gone through similar, you know, like I said, mm -hmm. my, my, my past, you know, career as a medic, I've seen some things that, you know, at the time, you know, didn't really, 
I don't, I don't want to say it didn't affect me, but it, it, it took a long time for it to build up until the point where, you know, but, but people that don't go through that situation, that, that, you know, depression, they don't understand how dark it is. I mean, I, my whole, I mean, I had a, you know, great childhood, grew up, had great friends, family, but it got just everything during the day. It was still dark because it was dark inside of me, you know, uh, people that, that I should have, you know, um, been happy with and nothing, yeah. nothing made me happy, you know, and I, and I, and again, I mean, I was a medic for 20 plus years. It, it didn't happen overnight. It almost <laughs> felt like, like it was just a normal day until it got to the point where it started really to affect my relationships with people that I loved. Yep. And then, like you said, I mean, I, I was the same way, you know, I'm thinking, I'm, you know, the, the fire department would say, you know, you know, we have a program if you need to go talk to somebody. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I, I don't need that. I'm fine. Yep. And then until I had someone in my life that you know, was an expert said, you, you need to go see somebody, Dave, because it's not going to end well. And yeah. I thought, wow, okay, but you're right. As soon as I started talking to people, you know, and uh, counseling and all that stuff, it was unbelievably so you're right people that are, that are listening right now that may be going through this thinking i can handle this i can you know i can deal with it you know you know uh self-medicating with drugs alcohol you know whatever the case yeah. is that's not that's not the way to do it but it, yeah it, especially as 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 a man right society tells us as men you know suck it up you're a man. You, you hear you hear the man up thing. You've heard that your whole life. I heard that my yeah. whole life. You know, boys don't make cry. yourself happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, for the longest time, like my outlet was going to the gym, lifting the weights, hitting the bags, hitting the pads, and then even that mm -hmm. wasn't doing anything for me. And yeah. I would get up every day, and I would go to work, and I would act like everything's fine. And that actually makes things worse. You are trying so hard to put on this front. Yeah, and I'm doing my best there. I'm interacting with people. I'm smiling. It's all fake. Yeah, it's all fake. No part of me wanted to be there. I would come home and I would do my best to interact with my daughter. And I know that I wasn't there. I know that in that time, I was not the best dad or husband that I could be. I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, and my wife, she didn't, she knew that I was dealing with things, but she didn't know what to do. Right. Like, yeah, not a lot of people know how to interact with someone. Yep. Right. So like, luckily at our company um, and then working at Intel, we're doing, I don't know if you guys have heard of QPR. I haven't. Mm -hmm. So it's a question, <laughs> uh, persuade and refer. And it's kind of like what you were talking about earlier with the, the program that you had did. It, it teaches you how to, how to help interact with people like that, how to help talk to them, how to help kind of get to the bottom of what's going on. And well, you might QPR, be, QPR questions, persuade, refer. It's a, it's, it's a training. We do it online. We've had, we've had some meetings about it. I actually went to, um, the ASSE conference in San Antonio, uh, a few months ago and we talked about it there. And th so my boss, uh, he had that training. He was one of the first people at our company to have it. And we went to lunch one day and he, luckily he knew, he knew how to talk to me came to it um he told me that he had noticed some significant differences in yeah. the way i'm doing everything from work to just basic interacting with people and he asked me what was going on and you know after a few questions it's kind of like the five whys right like why did this happen well, why did you do it that way well what caused this right so he he went down that and in a roundabout way, he's the one that kind of helped push me to go get help. Hmm. He, he looked at me and he said, what as a company can we do to help? you?" And so he's the one, he helped me be able to go see a therapist on my lunchtime and, and stuff like that. But he had that training, that QPR. And then after I kind of got through my rough patch, um, which is still a daily thing, right? It's still, it never completely goes away. We work at it daily. 
can't right. just can't just get rid of it. You got to work at it daily. So I still work at it, but I did the training. And okay. me being an introvert like I am naturally, one day just a few months ago, I got up at our all hands meeting, which was around five hundred employees. Ooh. And I told my story and I kind of broke down in tears when I did it. And here I am kind of embarrassed, right? I didn't realize how much that helped the amount of people that called me or pulled me to the side throughout the day to just yeah. tell me, they said, I felt like there was no one else in the room and you were talking. Yeah. To me. Yeah. The, made a big difference. I feel like I helped a lot of people and I helped, I feel like I helped kind of break that stigma, right? You got the, the, the buff fighter yeah. guy up on stage <laughs> breaking down into tears, talking in front of all these construction workers mm -hmm. who have been holding this stuff in for however long. Yeah. And the amount of people that reached out to me after that day was, was insane to me. Like yeah. how I did not realize being open about it would help as much as it did. It's amazing. Amazing story, dude. It's like a shadow group because like you said, you, you think you're the only person yeah. that's going through that. <laughs> and then once someone like you comes out and comes out of the shadow and says, this is what I'm dealing with, then you're right. People go, holy shit, I'm not alone. Yeah. And then before you know it, there's just quite a few guys going, we're not alone. So now all that, all this, you know, you know, mental issues that they're going through, it, it's out of the shadows. And, and just like changing this, the, the safety culture that, that we're all trying to do from the old safety guy that would bird dog people and people hated the safety guy and, right. oh, he's an asshole. We're trying to change that culture. And now yeah. with the mental mental health stuff we're trying to change that to you it and and i've told people this um you're not weak for coming out and saying i, I need help i'm having issues exactly you're actually strong because you're doing that because that takes yeah. a lot of courage like you said to stand up in front of all those guys a big buff fighter like you are that took more probably more courage than it, it than it would to, to get into a ring with somebody that 270 pound guy yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think my armpit I don't think my armpits have ever been that sweaty than when I was standing on that stage <laughs> that day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh man Brandon, appreciate your vulnerability and that word for some reason is always effed with me anyways. I can't say that vulnerable you know you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. We appreciate see, that. See see I would say, you know, that that's a Texas thing, but you're from Texas too, so I can't say that. <laughs> I knew that was coming, Dave. But I've said this before, and and I think you you set the perfect example of what I've always tried to say and, and make a point across is great leadership or true leadership grows or stems from vulnerability because once you put yourself in that state, the courage that it takes to to be vulnerable anyways is huge but then like you said after your speech all those people came up to you and started talking to you and said hey man i felt like i was the only one in the room you know that's a leadership that never would have mm -hmm. surfaced from you if you hadn't put yourself in that vulnerable state so i've always said vulnerability is a is a catalyst for just great leadership that you know you just you're just stuffing down because i'm a macho um can't be i, I can't talk about my feelings i can't do this when mm -hmm. you know and and people like your size in a sense the intimidation factor has a people already look up to that in a sense anyways just because of what you have physically you know so you already got to step a you already got a leg up on some of the other uh, opportunities for leadership anyways, just cause your size, right? Somebody like me, who's little, I got to really, I got to really uh, show <laughs> that, Hey, I'm serious. I'm here for you. You know, I'm not this, I'm not that, but um, there. So yeah, really appreciate your story coming out like that. And, I, and any of our listeners, uh, as you know, they could always 
if, if I don't want to speak for you, but reach out to you if they're having Absolutely. issues. Okay. All right. Please. Y'all, y'all heard yeah. that here. I won't even say that you can. Please do. I, I, I ask <laughs> you to please do it. Um, you know, what worked for me might not work for you, but if there's a chance that I can help, help you figure it out in a way that I'll do that. I want to do that. I, I don't want anyone to ever experience what I went through. I know a lot of people do, and I hate knowing that because it was, it was brutal. It was the worst thing. And mm -hmm. then, and you think about in construction, that's the leading cause of death Yeah, is, is suicide. It's, it's a, it's a lonely road. A lot of these people are traveling. They're away from home. Uh, mm -hmm. but, and it's all they know. They don't know how to break out of it. If you're feeling that way, please reach out to me. Yeah. Let me, awesome. let me, let, let me help however I can. Even, even if you just need to vent, sometimes someone needs a good venting session. Hey, yeah. Yeah. give me a call and I can be your just sounding a, board. I'm going to say just a verbal punching bag in, in, in your That's world. It. That's <laughs> yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. That's it. Not everyone is looking for advice. Some people just need to get it off their chest. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm here for any, anything that anyone needs. What we can do is, um, you want us to just post your Facebook link in the description yep. when yep. we publish this so that they can reach out to you. Yep. Perfect. Facebook messaging you or just, uh, just get to know you that way. Absolutely. So man, appreciate it. And again, perfect example why Dave and I started this podcast. It's to, you know, just quick background. We started it just to talk about standards, you know, because real world scenarios, OSHA standards, site specific policies, things like that are always black and white. So we wanted to give people examples of what we did in the field versus the way the standard wrote was written and how the site specific policy goes, how we, how we combed through that gray area, but still stayed compliant. And then we just felt like we wasn't really touching our listeners the way that we really wanted to. And so we started this side of it, interviewing, and you're a perfect example of why we transitioned into this way uh, to reach out, knowing somebody that's from Texas in Oregon now. And, you know, now it's just building, building a huge fan base and can't thank you enough for sharing your story with us. Uh, I, I really appreciate you guys having me on, you know, like, a year ago, me a year ago would have never been able to do this. It's I, I therapy's helped me grow a lot and especially being introverted. But now I'm in meetings like these big meetings, speaking in front of people. I'm going to these conferences and I, I really am trying to spearhead this thing. And I really, I'm really trying to be a voice for the people that feel like they don't have one. So awesome. Excellent. Well, y'all heard it here. If you have any issues, suicide or September's coming up. And speaking of that, do you have you heard of Out of the Darkness Walks, that organization? I have, yes. Okay. Or I didn't know if you were involved with them or anything like that as well. I've heard of them. I'm not heavily involved with them, but I'm definitely okay. I'm definitely making strides to be more involved in these different organizations that are doing it. Excellent. Yeah, that's one of them. And um, almost everybody in the construction field knows Dr. Sally. Have you heard of her? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she's got a really good story too about her brother. If you haven't heard of that, so it's it's um she really hits hits home on a lot of a lot of points that we deal with, and just like you mentioned earlier, with so much traveling, family time missing, what do we yeah. do? You know, we work twelve hour days. You know, when I was doing seven twelves, the in, this is how bad it is. When I was doing seven twelves, the first thing I looked for was my drop and drop and fold. You know, I'm because I'm not going to waste. You know, right. two hours of the one day I, if if I do get one day off of doing laundry. So yeah, find my hotel. Then the very next thing is where can I get my laundry done and who yeah. does the drop and fold? <laughs> so that, I mean, that's, the, that's our life. And then we go back yeah. to a hotel, pick up whatever type of groceries we can get to get us to the week. Yep. And um, it's a, it's a lonely life. It, it really mm -hmm. can be. Yep. And, some people deal with that loneliness with drugs or alcohol sometimes, which yep. makes things worse. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then some of the marriages that fail is companionship. You know, you'll go out there, man or woman, you'll go out there and find somebody that may give you that attention and 
fortunately one thing leads to another and there you have it you know mm -hmm. yeah that that, that that little bit of attention isn't worth throwing your life away over. It's not. Exactly. Not at all. Yeah, not and, at and all. like you said, you know, you, you know, people try to deal with it with you know, drugs and alcohol. And, you know, that 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 along with being away from home for a while makes you paranoid. So then uh, now you're yeah. thinking your spouse <laughs> is doing something they shouldn't be doing. And yep. then now you take that to work. Now you become the angry guy. And yeah, your, your whole life just kind of snowballs down a hill. And then, yeah. and then when you're at work doing that, your brain's not, in. You're, no, you're, yeah. your head is somewhere else. And now, exactly. now and, you're not seeing the snake in the grass that you're going to trip over and hurt mm -hmm. yourself. You're going to miss the little pivotal step in your procedure because you're not thinking correctly. Exactly. Yep. And some of the physicians out there have it worse because we got our, the world we live in now is instant you know we always got cell phones so like if you're an operator you're going to be operating on that phone all day trying to where's your wife where's your husband you're calling them all mm -hmm. the time or you're trying to text them hey you haven't called me back yet what are you doing and yeah. you got to get work going or you know and then even an office staff you, you may miss a big production meeting because you're out driving around in the field on the phone trying to find out what's going on back home yeah, yeah, I mean, it like, spirals everywhere. It does. And I think of like, you know, like a crane operator who's <clears> having that struggle and he's like shaking because he's upset and his mind's yeah. not in it. He's trying to operate these controls. Like it takes you completely out of what you're doing. So, yep. Yeah, it does. So just know that you're not alone out there, listeners. This is a big, big deal in our industry. Brandon's gone through it. He was uh, open enough to share his story. and it encourages you to reach out to him if you are feeling any way. Uh, and we, Dave and I encourage you to do that as well. This is exactly yeah. again, why we did this podcast. We wanted it to be a vessel for anybody to reach out to anybody for, uh, any struggles or even knowledge or just anything like that. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. They're hey. all <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> that was a great segue to light, light, lighten the mood a little bit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so Brandon, I mean, just to reach out, I mean, if you need any help as far as your sponsorships, we don't we don't have anything on this podcast, but we would love to, uh, you know, uh, help your journey turning pro because both of us have been in the sport. It's nothing to do with us or this podcast is just too retired fighters <laughs> i guess you say we retired right <laughs> that's right that, 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 that's a brotherhood though not a lot of people under, understand what it's like to train even if you never got in the cage and competed just stepping foot on those mats takes a lot yep. of courage too so it yeah. does i remember my first competition was a naga tournament i met matt hughes which oh. never been starstruck yeah. before i've met a couple other <laughs> celebrities in my life but when I walked by him, dude, goosebumps stood on the back of my neck. Uh -huh. I was like, holy, it's, holy shit, it's him. Whoa, yep. in the flesh. And um, I, I had trained six days. I started started training, competition came up, and I wanted to do it. I waited six hours to fight, and this guy ended up being a sandbagger. He was an actual blue belt. Dropped oh. down. Blew through, blew through the whole division, won both golds in gi and no gi at Naga. And then uh, to my credit, though, I was told I was the only one that put him on his back. So that made me feel good, you know. Yeah. You go. <laughs> Small goals, then, uh, buddy. I think, I think I've done two. I, I think you should get back into it. I want to. I really do. I did. Um, I think I've done two or three other competitions. And I've always... So in practice, I always practiced the choke, but I never did it, never had it on me. And then in a competition, I tapped out, I lost. I had to tap out through the baseball choke. And if you've ever been tapped out through a baseball choke, that is the worst choke you could ever get put into. <laughs> and I promise I'll never get put in that position again. That's how bad it is. I saw stars in two seconds. It was it's, that it's more of a rare one. Yeah. But he had me. I was passing guard all day. So I, ha I was in guard, 
and I was up on him, and then I came in this way. Like, I got in an opposite rappel grab. I was trying to do a choke, too, but he dropped his guard, and I didn't see it. And I was passing all day, so when he dropped his guard, he had me up here the same way, and I just didn't realize it. And then when I crossed over guard, that's when he went in and turned upside down and locked it and just, oh. yep. <laughs> it, and then, buddy, it knocked me on my butt. I was like, holy cow. I looked it's at my coach. He was like, he got you in a baseball choke. I said, when we get back to class, you're teaching me that, and I'm never going to cop that thing again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think I did one competition afterwards, and sure enough, never. I, I'm yeah. so uh, aware of that where his hands are going, I'll mm -hmm. never get caught in that choke again. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to get back into training. I, I love it. I, and I, I want to. I really do. I'm I 46 think, I, now. I think you'd do me some good. Hey, think, Corey, think, I'll, yeah. I'll make you a deal, buddy. If you get back into it, I'll be your cut man. How's that? <laughs> okay. Yeah, hey, Brandon. I love it. Same thing for you, buddy. You you call me. I'll be on the flight. And I'll, I'll be your I'll be your cut man. Yeah, I'm gonna hold you to it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're about out of our hour. Don't want to take up much more of your time. But Brandon, uh, great story. I think our listeners are going to get a lot of value out of this. Uh, please, we welcome you back anytime you want to come on or show up. Just definitely. give us a yes. ring, and and we'll definitely have you back as well. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me. Matter of fact, we might set yeah. an appointment after December, whenever your your first pro, yes. pro fight is, so we could talk about it. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. Love it. Brandon, again, oh, man, yeah. enjoyed it. Dave? Yes. Uh, thank you for, you know, cutting out some time for us on your weekend. Really appreciate it. I tell you what, a lot of, a lot of good conversation, a lot of good information. Uh, I, I think we touched on a lot of stuff. You, you're, you're a very, you know, not just physically broad, but you're very broad in your, in your life and, you know, what you're into. I mean, not just, you know, MMA and safety, but, you know, the, the issues that you've went through and you come out the other end and Cobra, Cobra, Kai, that Cobra Kai, give me a break. Hell yeah. <laughs> but, but our listeners, I, I, I know they got something out of it. And I just, again, I, I appreciate you just giving us your time. Absolutely. Same Thank here. You. Well, man, you go enjoy that beautiful family on that beautiful day that you yeah. got up there in Oregon right now and and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend, man. Thanks so much. You guys too. Stay cool. All right. All right. Be safe. Bye. Have a good one.